Okay, moving then to our first briefing uh, for our inquiry into shared and integrated education, dissolving boundaries program. Um, just refer you to the clerk's cover note at page 19 and refer you to relevant papers, including briefing papers from Professor Austin and a copy of the 2010-11 ATIDES Inspectorate joint evaluation of the dissolving boundaries program. And just for you to note that the session will be recorded by Hansard. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I welcome you to the committee this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. Professor Austin, would you mind um, introducing your, your colleagues and then making a, an opening statement and members will follow up with some questions. Well, colleagues, um, good morning and thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you about the research that we've been doing. Um, I uh, thought it was important to bring with me uh, two colleagues, two teachers who've been involved in our work uh, so that you can hear from the, uh, the chalk face exactly how this works. Um, I think you all have a copy of this, uh, this document, the summary. Um, it seemed to us that the work which we'd been doing in the Dissolving Boundaries Programme, um, which has been running for 15 years and is a north-south programme, um, offered us some very interesting data about the way that you can use technology to link schools together combined with a face-to-face -face contact. And that this experience, this evidence, might be particularly interesting for your committee in the context of thinking about ways that you can develop shared education so that it reaches potentially every child, even those in the most geographically isolated schools. So I've started this um, paper by simply noting that there is a challenge that even according to the Department of Education's own figures, uh, around 20% of schools, they tell me, have had no involvement at all in any form of shared education. Um, so the presentation is saying this is one way that we might be able to reach that group while at the same time offering schools that are already engaged in some face-to-face -face contact an additional means of strengthening and deepening the partnership. Um, okay, so uh, when I use the term blended learning, um, I'm talking about this mixture of long-term online contact over a whole year with face-to-face -face contact. And I, I would like to sort of stress that this is not all online. We think there's a real value in using both face-to-face -face and online connection. Um, so, um, just briefly, 3.1. Um, it's just to say that the Dissolving Boundaries was a very substantial program. I think we can say that there's a, a base here, uh, both from special schools, primary schools, and post-primary schools, over 15 years, uh, with 50,000 young people, 2,500 teachers, 570 schools. In other words, the evidence from this um, work, I, I think, is substantial. Um, you may know this, but uh, just for the record, um, the Dissolving Boundaries Programme was funded by the Departments of Education in Belfast and Dublin, but it was managed by uh, Ulster University um, and our colleagues in Maynooth. When we um, sat for a moment and said, right, so after 15 years' work and all that investment, what exactly have we learned that might be of value um, to the system, it seemed to us there were some key lessons. Um, and I'm going to uh, invite Alison and Anton to uh, add their points here. But number 3.2, um, I want to just stress that whatever recommendations your committee might come up with, I know you'll be very conscious that in the end, uh, if the teachers are not on board, not supportive, it's not going to work. Um, and it's partly for that reason that I'm, I'm really very pleased that from their, their different types of schools, and they'll tell you more about where they're teaching, um, that um, teachers are central to the delivery of any of this. And what we found 
was that there was absolutely no substitute for bringing the teachers from the two schools together and allowing them to spend time learning the technology together and then saying, OK, how are we going to plan a programme of work that's going to engage our respective classes? So, um, can I... Anton, do you want to add a little to what I've said on that point? No problem. Uh, my name is Anton Morn. I'm presently a principal at Ballyhackett Primary School in Castle Rock. I've been in post for the past 11 months. Um, my current school is presently in shared education partnership with Castle Row Primary School in Coleraine, and we have been sharing education with them since 2009. Um, we were part of the original PI cohort, um, and we're now funded through uh, Queen's University in Belfast. Uh, my previous school was a Holy Family Primary School in Maherfelt, um, and in my role as Year 5 teacher there, I was also Dissolving Boundaries Coordinator, and that's where I have linked in with uh, Roger's programme. Um, I took part in the Dissolving Boundaries programme from 2007 to 2014 when uh, it, it finished, and that was seven years in total. Um, I also, through completing my master's degree from the University of Ulster in 2010, uh, I produced a research paper um, entitled uh, Dissolving Boundaries Programme, uh, a revised curriculum perspective. Um, so the key benefits, in my opinion, of uh, the type of blended approach which the Dissolving Boundaries Programme um, promoted. Um, I would have found a significant enhancement of pupils' ICT skills um, over and above the pupils who were not involved in the project. Um, through my research, um, I, I surveyed the participating uh, teachers and I also did two case studies. Uh, I found that uh, the Dissolving Boundaries Programme complemented perfectly the revised curriculum as it was in 2010, especially in a cross-curricular sense. Um, it also gives the opportunity for us as teachers to um, for the requirements of SIA assessment. Um, the work that we do uh, fits in well with that and allows us to uh, tick that box, so to speak, um, as regards assessment opportunities within um, primary education. Um, Dissolving Boundaries also provides uh, a strong purpose and context for the children's learning. Um, and, and I've found, especially uh, through my work, it, it, it is a, the improved motivation of the pupils, um, especially boys, and, uh, and also those pupils who have significant barriers to their learning. Uh, the whole use of ICT, um, uh, specifically in communication. Uh, one particular example that, that I had found was, was a, a boy that I taught, an autistic child, um, who struggled to communicate verbally, but uh, the parents came to me and said he loved video conferencing because he actually spoke into the camera rather than to a person's face. Mm. Uh, he, he struggled with that and, and actually couldn't uh, do that, but he, he was able to talk into the camera because um, he w didn't feel that pressure to communicate uh, face to face. Um, so those are kind of simple little examples that, that, that show the power of, of technology if it's used correctly uh, in education. Can I come back to you in a minute? Alison, just on the point of the importance of teachers coming together um, and are you an ICT specialist? No, I am definitely not an ICT specialist. Yeah. Um, and so this uh, pushed me, pushed my boundaries <coughs> of ICT. But I was so enthusiastic about the project that it made me want to come to grips with video conferencing. And when the children were moodling each other, which was a bit like emailing, trying to follow their string of thought, they were all happy to go ahead with it. And it was, it was a challenge to me to, at the start. And then each year when I became comfortable, another teacher was brought in. And on occasion, they would be calling me for advice. How do I set the video conferencing up? Or, but it required a lot of um, planning at the beginning with the, the partner teacher, with your twin teacher, um, to make sure that this was going ahead. 
And I think this connects to the next point, which is 3.3. Um, everything which took place in dissolving boundaries was rooted in the curriculum. In other words, we didn't um, in any, at any time say we expect this to be done as an extracurricular activity after schools or at lunchtime. It should be enriching what you're doing already. Um, and, and I can say that obviously the curriculum in Northern Ireland is not the same as the curriculum on the other side of the border. That presented some challenges for yeah. teachers. But thinking about the application of this to shared education, it's obviously going to be a much easier process since uh, we all have a, uh, the same curriculum. Um, one thing I'd like to, to stress about my 3.3 is that after the teachers completed their day's training, they each signed up to a learning agreement. Uh, in effect, a form of contract about what they were going to be doing for the whole year. And they kept a copy and their principal had a copy and the two universities had a copy. So, in other words, there was a, a process of ensuring that promises and agreements made at the time were then followed through. And uh, the other thing I'd just say about 3.3 is to stress the huge variety of projects that schools actually did, all the way from enterprise. We had two schools running many companies together uh, across the border. Um, we had lots of projects to do with science, um, uh, children carrying out experiments in two schools. We had projects in history, geography, English, and the enterprise work, of course, connected very well into numeracy. So, in other words, this is not confined just to citizenship. That's the point I want to make. It's not one element of the curriculum. It's potentially any part of the curriculum that the teachers c agree they can work on that forms the core of the work that's done. Um, do you want to add anything to, to that point? Uh, and I would emphasize the point that Roger made uh, as regards good planning at the start. Uh, <coughs> I have both sides of the perspective, as in the dissolving boundaries and the, the shared education. And through both, uh, there's a very similar approach from my two experiences and, and the key in my opinion, the first critical step in education is good planning at the start with your partner school or partner teacher. And even for that, um, in my new school, I'm using the experiences that I've, that I've developed and, and found in Solving Boundaries to, to take my new shared education partnership and add ICT, as th use that to enhance the experience. And I've already done so. We've had. Um, shared teacher training uh, through video conference. We've shared lessons between pupils and pupils um, between, between the both schools. Um, and the benefits that I see and that, that I'm aiming to, to implement in my new um, partnership will save money also. Um, I mean, presently we, we spend uh, approximately Two and a half thousand pounds on transport, transporting people to and from one side of Coleraine to the other, um, and I would aim, you know, at the very least, to cut that by a quarter um, by using video conferencing um, and communicating online. We're going to pick up on the question of costs in a minute. Um, uh, Alison, unless you want to say anything about 3.3, .3, may I go on to yeah, no, 3.4? No. Yeah. So um, <coughs> you might say this all sounds uh, like a great plan, where's the evidence that it actually has any, any, makes any difference uh, to the children that take part? Um, you'll find in the, the coloured the, the version of the document um, a whole list of um, academic references, um, including um, this book that came out last year. Um, I, I think I can say to you that the evidence is strong, that the impact of this on young people, even a year after they had stopped their participation in Dissolving Boundaries, still showed that they were more open, more curious, more interested in diversity than the children in the same schools that had not taken part. Um, so that's, that for us uh, is an important finding. Um, and I think, um, as Anton said, 
We need to bear in mind that uh, for many of these youngsters, the idea of communicating with a distant audience is enormously motivating. They're not just producing work, for, forgive me, for their teachers. They're producing work that other children on another school are going to be looking at. And in many, many instances, teachers reported that this meant that the pupils took a great deal more care over what they sent, how much they sent, um, uh, in other words, the overall quality of information improved as a result of having that connection. Um, any, Alison, did you want to say anything about the impact on your children? In I mean, I, they could log on to the Dissolving Boundaries site <coughs> from home, and I find that some of them wanted to do that. They were getting home, and I was finding posts you know, at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the evening, so that they were really motivated to keep the link going. Um, um, but it links so well into the uh, ICT uh, curriculum with the exchange, which is difficult to make a meaningful exchange, but this was a really meaningful exchange between children. Do, do, colleagues, I'm sure you know this, but CCEA have an expectation that all schools now ha make sure that their pupils undertake a range of ICT tasks which are assessed. And those are grouped under five E's, explore, exhibit, evaluate, etc., etc. And one of them is E for exchange. In other words, an expectation that they use ICT to exchange with somebody else. And it's the one area that I think some schools struggled with unless they had a partnership with another yeah. school. Uh, Anton, yes. I think the beauty of this type of approach is... Um, <coughs> the key here is ICT is now a cross-curricular skill. It, it's not a subject on its own. Uh, as a teacher, you're expected to use ICT through your, all your other subjects. So this, uh, this approach is, is exactly how it is used, and, and it's really um, ICT is used as a vehicle, really, to, to support the children's learning in, in a cross-curricular sense. Okay, um, if this is okay, Madam Chair, we'll just press on um, briefly. Um, what have we learned about how you manage something like this? Um, so 3.5 lessons for programme coordination. Well, the university took the lead, um, but I think I really want to emphasise the fact that we couldn't have done this had it not been for a very strong partnership with C2K, of course provide all the hardware, and all the schools. With CCEA, we worked very closely with them to ensure that the work we did was appropriate for these ICT assessment, assessment tasks. And we had the real benefit of advisors in the Education and Library Boards nominating schools to take part. So we, we felt blessed to have such a strong uh, partnership. Um, and I think what this meant was that we were able to have a very, very wide range of schools, from special schools, Irish medium schools, primary <coughs> schools. Every type of school that there is in Northern Ireland uh, was represented on dissolving boundaries. Briefly, um, 3.6, um, the practicalities of this from the programme management. Uh, the university employed two staff, um, and I had 15% of my time uh, protected to direct the program. Um, and I think I want to just uh, underline the final sentence that teachers felt strongly there was a need for third party experts to train, support, and encourage teachers in this specific area of education. <clears throat> um, I, I, I make the, the point, colleagues, because um, I'm aware that. Um, there has been some suggestion that money for shared education should simply go to schools and invite them to, to do what it is they want to do. Um, I think we should reflect carefully on whether there's a role for third parties to play the kind of role that the university played in supporting what happened. Um, 3.7, costs. Um, what did we do? Well, we gave um, a grant of £350 towards, to every school to, towards the cost of a face-to-face -face meeting. That was never actually enough to cover all the costs. And I think what's impressed us is the way in which the schools um, 
either covered the rest of this from their own resources or they invited children and parents to contribute. Um, teachers who completed the agreed work programme had a grant of £500 in the first year, which reduced to £200 for subsequent years. This was a way of ensuring that when we had trained teachers in the first year, that we kept them in play. In other words, that we sustained this. It wasn't a meteorite flashing through the sky briefly and then fizzling out. But there was, this had a, a, was a way of ensuring that the expertise that was being built up in the schools was sustained. So um, I think the key thing there is that the average cost per pupil of taking part was £75 per annum. Um, I'm not sure what other figures you have, but for us that looked like exceptionally good value for money. So, um, final section um, from us. Um, you know, what are the possible implications for shared mm. education? Well, when, when we, we've reviewed all the research and policy work that's been done up to now, I think it's fair to say that most of the energy has gone into moving children, bussing them from one site to another. And of course there is a place for that. But in our view, insufficient attention has been paid to the role of ICT. And I just underline the point that every single school in Northern Ireland already has all the equipment they need to work together. It's, it's there, provided through C2K, broadband is there, the video conferencing is there, and so is the virtual learning environment. All it needs is, if you like, a good purpose to use it. Um, second point, um, it makes use, this kind of approach uses the existing ICT infrastructure in a cost-effective way, and the skills that the children are learning in working with others who are a little bit different are not just good, if you like, for shared education, they're actually very, very important in the context of, of developing the kind of skills that employers want. So I think there's a real um, connection to the broader employability agenda. Anton, I think you wanted to come in and say something on these two points. Uh, I agree. Um, as regards the skill, with Rogers, as he said, regards the skills, employability skills that, that em employers are looking. Uh, another key point that regards the program that it was specifically done in group tasks, so that the children were, were uh, divided into groups in both schools. Um, and a key benefit that I saw was the actual interaction um, between the groups from school to school, but also within the group uh, in the classroom situation. Um. Okay. Um, thanks, Anton. Um, just to conclude, colleagues, 4.4, um, uh, just to say to you that every school in Northern Ireland has been sent a copy um, of this document. Uh, and finally, to say to you that um, this year, the University of Ulster is running a, a prototype of what could be developed. Uh, it's called ePartners. Um, it is um, going to include Allison School. Um, it includes students from the university going into the schools to act as a mentor. Um, and again, the model is using technology to connect schools together um, with a face-to-face uh, encounter. Um, I have to say that um, our capacity uh, in ePartners is limited um, in the sense that the funding comes through widening access, and that means that we can only work with schools that are meet a particular criteria in terms of economic and social need. So just to make the point, Anton's school would be not be allowed in, but um, uh, Alison's would. Um, we would very much like to be in a situation where we had the funds to be able to broaden this approach to recruit a much larger number of schools. So, colleagues, thank you very much for listening to that opening presentation from us. And we're very happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation and also for the, the paper which you supplied to the committee. Um, obviously, the, the reports which we've seen are all very positive around dissolving boundaries, but, but why did the funding essentially end in 2014? Uh, you probably need to ask the Department of Education that question. Um, we w were 
not really given um, a clear answer. Um, I, I have a sense that, uh, because obviously, we're working in partnership with Dublin. Um, I think, uh, if one can believe the rumours, uh, um, Dublin civil servant in Dublin decided that, you know, 15 years was quite long enough. Thank you. Um, and it was time to review not only dissolving boundaries, but also the European Studies Programme, which had been running for an even longer period of time. So I think they wanted to possibly say, we're going to take stock and stop these programmes and have an opportunity to stand back and reflect and review on the best way forward. Okay, uh, and obviously I mean, you have talked about the, this, this new prototype that you, uh, programme which you're looking at, but um, has that left a vacuum where you once were able to um, bring schools together, particularly around the ICT project. Yes, it has. Um, and have those skills um, continued any relationships since then? Um, to a very limited extent. Um, we know this because uh, we, we, we encourage them to continue. Um, I, I think this was an instance where the absence of a coordinating a third party made it very <coughs> difficult for the schools. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I did contact my partner school whenever we heard that the funding was ending, but I haven't heard back. I would have been keen to continue this, but if something goes wrong with the uh, video conferencing, well, there wouldn't have been a safe site for the children to communicate through, would have been the first thing. Mm -hmm. And the video conferencing we could have done, and then with the help of C2K, they would have supported us in, in any problems with that. But uh, I think it's so important for teachers to get together at the beginning of, of a project, at the beginning of the academic year, and plan to go forward and agree, you know, sign, a, yeah. as Roger said, a contract to go forward with that. Uh, from a shared education standpoint, I, I know my current school, uh, when, when the money ran out through PI project, this whole idea of sustainability, uh, the whole point of the project was that it would be sustainable after, the, with or without funding, but when it, when it comes down to it and, and you, the, the funding helps to, to kind of um, make that partnership strong, um, and, and the point that I made previously as regards uh, transport to and from schools, unless you have that uh, significant amount of funding, which we are very lucky to have presently through Queen's University. Um, if we did not have that funding, well then, um, yes, we could have a, a continue the partnership, but it would be a very, uh, it would be a shadow of what it, it possibly could be, and that's where the point I made previously, the role of ICT here can help to uh, uh, limit the amount of money that you, you possibly would need to spend. Okay. So, but were, were this approach to be mainstream, particularly around a shared education programme, which sort of elements of what you have done through Dissolving Boundaries do you believe would be success, are successful enough to be included in that type of programme? Which elements? I, I think the key things are bring the teachers together to plan. Uh, obviously, there is a cost involved in doing that. Mm -hmm ensure that the technology is available for them to use, and that would be both uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, th there is a new video conferencing piece of software called Collaborate. That's what we're going to be using in ePartners. And the VLE, the Virtual Learning Environment, is Frontier. So in ePartners, we're going to be bringing the teachers together in January. They'll be trained in how to use Collaborate and Frontier. These are the two crucial tools for the children to work together. Um, so that is the absolute minimum core that you need. You've got to have time to bring the teachers together. The technology has got to be in place. And then thirdly, all the evidence we have suggests that even a short face-to-face -face meeting, if it is seen as being connected into the work and the online work, uh, has a real it's really substantial. <laughs> okay. and you've, you've very clear evidence of a project which has worked. And I'm just wondering whether the department has approached you in preparation of policy for the development of a shared education bill. Um, indirectly, um, the uh, inspector responsible for shared education um, has been to see us, <clears throat> attended a symposium that we ran to launch this pamphlet, and. Uh, I understand that she is offering advice to the Department of Education on future policy development. Um, and I think she took the point that in all of the different approaches that there are, that a blended approach 
which included ICT, was really essential because how else would you reach all those outlying uh, rural primary schools, the ones that otherwise would find it exceptionally difficult or very costly to, to meet up with other, other schools? My present school is an example of one of those schools Roger is Roger's talking about. Um, in our most recent inspection report uh, this September 2014, uh, the inspectors reported that our shared education partnership was an example of our best practice, um, but that they also noted that it wasn't just beneficial for our school, uh, for a school of our size, but that it was essential uh, due to our rural and isolated location. Uh, we have a beautiful school up in Castle Rock overlooking the sea uh, on top of the mountain, so it's, uh, we are rural, we are isolated, but this, uh, this link-up that we have with Castle Rock Primary School is essential, and that has been backed up by ETA. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Craig. Thanks, Chair. Um, welcome to the committee, Professor Ross. <coughs> very welcome, as far as I'm concerned. My old university, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, fascinated with this, I would be one of these sort of technical people who loves this sort of uh, thing. But I can see a very, very clear implication in all of this already. Um, with the aerial learning communities with regard to A level um, mm -hmm. in schools, now, w one of the big conundrums there is always how do you provide? a wide enough range of choices for pupils. And the big issue for all of the schools has always been this issue of transport, transporting children between the different uh, sec you know, secondary schools to provide that. This clearly has implications as to how you circumvent yep. that entire issue. Um, do you agree with that? And, and if there is something there, what would the additional cost okay. to the school be? What, what technology do they need to implement, and what are the cost implications there to bring them up to that standard? Because there's clearly that can be offset against transport costs or removing them. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, everything, of course, I've said in this paper, and my colleagues have been talking about, is really about key stage two, key stage three. But you're absolutely right. What this is doing is to build a set of ICT skills amongst teachers and young people that would really come into their own when we get to 14 to 16 and 16 to 18 in terms of the, of the better access to a wider range of examination courses. Now, um, I think that is uh, already very common practice in parts of Newfoundland uh, because of their geographical situation. And the research from there indicates that there's no diminution in the overall performance of candidates who take courses online when they're still at school. But the very big advantage is that when they go to university, they're already prepared to be much more autonomous uh, and to fit in better into the kind of learning experience that they're going to encounter at university. So to answer your specific question about area learning communities, I think the way that you'd have to do this is that, I uh, hope this is not heresy, but actually I would say, let's have a look at the whole of Northern Ireland and say, where are there, where is there a need for either an academic or a vocational subject, which can't be met easily because there are only one or two pupils in many schools that want to take it. The answer, if you were to follow the Newfoundland model, is to say you create exemplary online resources, first of all, and you could do that in front of. But then you need to have locally uh, support and backup, which would, in my view, would come be provided by the, the staff in the area learning communities. So it's a combination of having excellent online materials and then local support within the area learning community. So the costs actually would be relatively small. I mean, you'd probably have to second uh, either teachers or experts to create th the content online and then make it available for all of the schools that wish to sign up for it. I'm sure uh, 
coming back on that, um, I, I'm no disagreement with what you're saying. Um, is there any resistance in um, teachers themselves around this? Now, I'm thinking probably of those who have been in education a lot longer than others. Um, I call it fear of new technology more than than anything. In your experience of implementing this, did you come come up against this? Um, I think that was an issue when we started in 1980. <coughs> I began doing this kind of work in 1986, um, and at that time there was a there was a I think a number of teachers who were fearful of technology. I think it's less and less the case, partly because, of course, every student going through teacher training at the moment, whether in Northern Ireland or elsewhere, are getting substantial online and ICT experience. Um, I think there's probably still some caution when it comes to public examinations. But I mean, you probably already know this, but I mean, moving image, A level, is already being provided partly online yeah. and is, is very popular. So I, I think provided that there is adequate support, I can't see any reason why other subjects shouldn't be treated in the same way. Yeah, it, all, it obviously brings a completely new concept to the whole principle of teaching right yeah. across the board. And it strikes me that younger teachers will accept that much faster than those who have been used to a different way of doing it. And I think that's yeah. what I'm trying to get at here. Interestingly, uh, in, in Canada, uh, they had to create a new, a new type of teacher called an M teacher, a mediating teacher. So these were teachers in schools that might not necessarily be a specialist in the subject, but their job was to ensure that the pupils that were taking the online course got to the right place at the right time if there was a video conference, ensure that they logged on. In other words, there was local support for the pupils to be able to do this, even if the subject, even if the teacher in the school was not necessarily a subject specialist. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Mr Newton. Thank you, Chair, and uh, I apologise to Professor Austin because I have to go up at 11. So can I say thank you to you and your colleagues because you've actually made the paper report actually come alive in, in, in what you've been saying, and your enthusiasm is obviously spilling over into uh, the, the committee today. Just, just a couple of points. There, there are obviously, I think, certainly factors that need to be taken into account in the shared education, in the work that you have done, the very positive work that you have done. I ask two, two questions. First of all, in terms of um, the limited face-to-face -face that pupils have, and certainly uh, the concept that I would have in my mind about shared education means a lot of contact <coughs> between pupils face-to-face. -face. Mm. Secondly, if, if the work that you had, and I think the Chair has touched on this one, if the work that you have done was to be mainstreamed, what would, that, what would be the implications for that, really? Well, um, the face-to-face -face, uh, contact in dissolving boundaries, and Anton and Alison will tell you, was often no more than the pupils meeting for a day. Yeah. And I have to say, I'm still astonished, really, that even such a small amount of face-to-face -face contact appeared to have such a str what we saw immediately after that was a big surge in online activity. Um, not to mention increased uh, exchange of messages before the face-to-face -face contact. So um, I think I can say to you that um, the evidence that we've got suggests that even limited face-to-face -face contact seems to be hugely motivating when it is part of this extended year-long online working together. Um, I don't know whether you want to say anything about that? Oh, definitely the build-up of relationships that happened during the video conferencing. And that to begin with, it was, you know, just their names and their favourite sports or something. But when they saw that they had so many things in common, and, they, and one year group decided to start playing their musical instruments. I had sort of left them alone and the children just, oh, I can do this. And then the other side, they were doing that back. And they just, they built up a relationship themselves 
which was almost like a, a real face-to-face -face relationship because of the video conferencing. It, it was, it was great. Well, I suppose one of the key decisions we had always had to make each year, at the start when we planned out what we were going to do, was when we were going to have a face-to-face -face meeting. Yeah. And uh, normally, most partnership, partnerships would have left it to the end of the year. There was one particular year where I decided to try it at the start of the year, and 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 I found that just worked just as well. Uh, that they actually met the, the, the other people from the other school, uh, they knew the names, and they were able to talk through their likes, their, their dislikes, and got a feel for each other. And then, whenever they went online, they were able to actually talk more to mm. each other ab ab about what they were learning. The, the key thing there, I think, is to try to make sure that the face-to-face -face thing doesn't happen right at the very end, when there's then no opportunity, if you like, to, to follow through on it. Um, so I hope that answered you. That yeah, and the mainstreaming, if it were to be mainstreamed, what are they? Well, um, if it was to be mainstreamed, um, I would say it could be done, uh, it seems to me, in a relatively uh, manageable way in terms of cost. I think it does need a third party. Uh, I can say to you that I mean, the University of Ulster would be very interested in continuing to play the role that it has. Uh, in this area of work. Um, I don't foresee any reason why this approach could not connect every single school. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you. you, Ms McLaughlin. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation today. Um, I mean, I, I agree in terms of the, the Insufficient focus sometimes on, on, on ICT, I think, across a number of sectors. Um, I think that goes without saying. But particularly in relation to the reviews that were conducted around dissolving boundaries, and, and, and there have been very solid reviews done, I think, and, and very positive feedback from them. But one of the issues was um, from the ETI review and the DESI review in 2010-11 about the programme being more linked with community relations um, in terms of greater use of online tools. Has there been, you know, is there any thinking going on? Has the programme itself adapted or have a view on, on community relations? Um. I want to make sure I understood your question. So most of the work would have been, if you like, around the subjects in the curriculum. Um, and you're saying that this didn't always lead to the development of community relations. Yeah, well, one, one of the things, just to be clear, one of the things that the review had said was that the work of the programme should be more closely linked. Ah, yeah. Um, well, as a result of, of that ETI report, um, I then um, made all of the research data available to the, um, those responsible for community relations in all the five boards. But, of course, uh, we had to leave it up to them to decide how best to implement it. And I, I think it's probably true to say that um, not everybody would have shared my enthusiasm for uh, the way that um, ICT and face-to-face -face work could be done together. So I think there is a, there's a great opportunity, if I can put it that way now. OK, and, and it, it's probably slightly linked, but you touched on it in your presentation around the definition of shared education. And I'm just wondering, in your view, should shared education be defined simply as educational outcomes, or should societal benefits be included in any definition? I think it should be both. Um, certainly when. When we think about shared education, I, I think I'm saying there is a real benefit in children from different parts, different communities coming together. Um, so there should be benefits in terms of use of technology, there should be benefits in terms of the curriculum work they do, and there should be benefits for society in terms of just a greater acceptance and respect and tolerance for difference. Okay. And, and just another point, Chair, if, if, if you will. I know you referred to the fact that this was a cross-border project, and, and, and I know you referred to um, schools engaging with schools that are further away. In my case, the school might be 10 minutes down the road. But yeah. I'm, I'm thinking specifically about obstacles that you may have encountered 
developing that 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 all Ireland cross border yeah. um, um, project? Uh, it's not a secret to say that that particularly at the beginning um, there were some controlled schools that were apprehensive about taking part. I think they feared that uh, parents might dislike what they were doing, even though they themselves could see lots of educational benefits. Um, but actually, that, that, uh, those anxieties were often um, turned out to be groundless, um, and teachers and principals became very adept at drawing parents in and involving them, even to the extent of you know, ensuring that parents came with the children if there was a face-to-face -face meeting on the other side of the border. So there were, can't say that everybody was instantly enthusiastic. There were some people that, that had reservations. But I think that once they began to see the, the, the benefits, and particularly the added motivation that they could see their children having you know, when they went home, I think even sceptical parents turned out to be um, persuaded that this was a good thing to do. Yeah. I'm thinking, just Chair, you know, in terms of education as an area of cooperation, that how this work can identify some of those all Ireland cross-border working relationships in terms of ICT uh, and how that can be f flushed out, I suppose, in, in relation to your work? We, we um, haven't been asked by the North South Ministerial Council to um, reflect um, on what we've learned from dissolving boundaries. All I can say is that if we were asked, we'd be very happy to go along and, and probably take a copy of this this leaflet with us. Um, I, I think the ending of funding uh, is, is a pity, uh, and it has certainly left a, a gap in terms of, of educational links uh, on, on a cross-border basis. Um, I, I have a, I'm a, a pragmatist, um, and I see an immediate and pressing need to try and draw lessons from this that can help us all in terms of shared education within Northern Ireland. Okay, and just satisfied definitely, finally, Chair, the, the, the external agency that you talked about, the third party influence, has that been costed? Um, well, it's costed in the, the figure of £75 per pupil. Um, so, that, in other words, that figure is made up of the budget was a certain amount of money to employ staff by the university and provide the grants to the pupils. Okay. okay, thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Mr. Lund. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for your presentation. It's been very interesting. Um, and you've, in, in your answer to Robin Newton's question um, about, about the, uh, the sort of the level of contact between the, the pupils, you, you've, you've actually um, helped, helped, perhaps pointed the way for us, because for those of us who think that the jury is still out on the whole shared education project, the main objection would be that the lack of potential societal benefit, mm. and that you put you, you transport your kids to another school for half a day or a couple of periods or whatever, at quite a bit of cost. Um, and that, that's all the contact there is, mm. and that, that doesn't develop from there. So this this idea that um, the kids get to know each other, even at a long distance in, in this case and start to exchange and so on. That's, that, that's reassuring for me in the terms of the potential for the shared education program. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I don't want to start and advocate for integrated education, but they would say that they're, they're at the point, their starting point is where the shared education program is trying to get to mm -hmm. in societal terms. So I think that's, that's, that's a good uh, pointer for us at least. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I think I can say this is it's a new model. Um, when, when we put this book together last year, it was the first time anybody had produced a research globally on how you can use the internet in a way that builds community cohesion. So the book's called Online Learning and Community Cohesion, with examples both from Northern Ireland, the island of Ireland, and the Middle East. So I think this is, it's a robust model. Um, and I think if, if it's got something really going for it, it is this capacity to reach out to everybody. 
I would hate to think that you know, shared education was only available for a few children who happened to be in geographical proximity to a, a, a different school. Is the, is, is the emphasis um, more at the moment, or well, it's finished now, but has it been more on, on the primary level than secondary? In, uh, in dissolving boundaries, we had roughly 50 50. Right. <clears throat> um, and of course, there were appreciable numbers of children in special schools as well. Um, <clears throat> at the moment, I can say that ePartners, uh, we ran that last year, and again, it was a mixture of primary and secondary. So I, I, I can say that in some respects, it's a little easier, and I hope you don't mind me saying that in primary schools, simply because the teacher has got the class all day long. It's a little easier to fit yeah. in a video conferencing. Mm -hmm. If you're in a secondary school and you've only got 40 minutes for history or maths, and you've then got to go somewhere else to do the video conferencing, it's a bit more complicated. So there are some logistical difficulties, I think, in the post-primary sector. Not insuperable, but I think it is more of a challenge for them. Yes. Probably more concentration on a particular subject. Yes. Yeah. And, and the way that the timetable is structured into the, these short blocks of time. Um, and in terms of your two schools, I mean, how, how much time would you actually spend on this in the course of a week, so, you know, formally and, and, and the link with another school? It's hard to break it down in the course of the week. Some weeks there might have been a lot of work done on it. We would have been video conferencing at least um, once a month and sometimes once a fortnight, um, and then the children would have been moodling. That's using the VLE. Yes, <laughs> Communi it's like a bit like texting or emailing each other. Um, Sorry, what's a VLE? Virtual learning environment. Ah. Yeah. So it was a bit like... But a safe area inside the internet. That's okay, I've got yeah. it. Okay. So they would have been doing that probably every week, and some of them would have been going home and doing it. And then the projects that we set up probably would have been, um, I don't know, an hour, um, an hour a week. Yeah. All my, year. my experience is very similar to Alison's. It, it, the way it worked, because it was a cross-border project, and I'll emphasise this point again that Roger made, their curriculum is structured differently to ours, um, and their peaks and troughs, really, to, to, to get yeah. the two matching together at the same time so there may have been a surge of activity yeah. one month and then because there was something else happening in the school down south. Whereas my experience through the shared education, because our curriculum in the two schools is the same, we do the same world around us topics, the teachers plan together, they do the same lessons, <coughs> evaluate together. Yeah. Much I, would, I would guess at, at the primary level that it might be a case of trying to get the kids to stop doing it rather than, you know, time limiting. I mean, that, that does sound like fun, actually. Mm. To, to keep them focused is yeah. is a difficulty, and and to keep it focused on the learning as such. But yeah. I suppose there is that kind of in interactive element, uh, which you don't want to take away from them either, and building that friendship and relationship online. Yeah, I certainly think you've, you've given us a lot of food for thought here. I'll say that. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and just before we move to Mr. Kinnan, can I welcome um, A Level's <coughs> politics students from, from Lurgan College? You're very welcome to this morning's committee, and I hope that you enjoy your, your short time with us. Mr. Kinnan? Thank you. Thanks very much, Chair, and uh, apologies for not being there at the beginning. I found that quite fascinating. I'm skeptical of. But coming over to your, your point of view, I was just yes. was fascinated. I've had a lot of complaints this summer about our C2K system, our computer system, not working. And I'm less aimed at you, Professor, but more at the others. Are our computer systems up to this, or do we really need, when we do the next contract, get ones in that are that much better and more able? Um, no systems are perfect. But um, what C2K does really well is to ensure that the children are completely safe online. Mm -hmm. And that's a real consideration for parents. If they're doing anything, any online work, they need to know that, that there's no risk whatsoever of predators getting in uh, mm -hmm. to any of the online work. In terms of reliability, um, I think what's impressed me about C2K is that they listen. We made some complaints about the quality of sound mm -hmm. and the video conferencing system uh, we were using before called Illuminate. 
they listened and they're in the process of introducing a new bit of software called Collaborate. So this is a, an improved video conferencing mm -hmm. system with much better quality sound. Um, in terms of the BLE, the virtual learning environment, um, I've heard different views about Fronter, which is the one that is in place in many schools. Mm -hmm. Some teachers love it and some are not so keen on it. But I think what I'd say is we shouldn't get hung up on any particular product. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's the process. It's the, you know, if it isn't Fronter, it's Moodle or... Mm -hmm. The point is that you know there are systems there that enable the children to do two really crucial things. First of all, to have a sort of a forum mm -hmm. where they can exchange fairly informal information, yeah. and then a work area. So this is where they're actually creating content mm -hmm. on the topic that they're working on. And we've s seen some fabulous examples where one school has put their work up in one colour, and the children in the other school have come along and said, yeah, we've got a bit to add here. In goes their stuff in a different colour. Mm -hmm. So they're contributing to the construction of knowledge but in a way which still recognises the contributions that both sides have made. So um, I think we've got to keep the pressure on C2K mm -hmm. to keep delivering what we have. But you know, when I compare what we have here, with, even with the rest of the UK, you could not do what we're proposing here in England. Right simply because they don't have a common platform. Yep. So I, I, I have to say, we are in a uniquely advantaged position to take advantage mm -hmm. of this opportunity. And the, the other angle to it, going to the other end of it, is the teachers, uh, we throw so much at you, or the department throws so much at you, whether you get this, not necessarily getting enough support from the boards or in the future. Is much time needed in your busy schedule. I mean, is that going to be one of our biggest problems, actually, teachers having time to do the preparation and the training for this, well, given everything else we throw at you? One quick word, and then I'll bring it in. I think, um, I think you do need a third party to coordinate the training, right. to l lay down the parameters of mm -hmm. what's to be done. Um, then the teachers go back, and we've tried as hard as we can to say, this should not be on top of what you already have to do. Right. This is okay. an enriched way of delivering the curriculum. Is that right, Alison? Yes, definitely. I mean, you definitely need the training yeah. in, the, in the technology. And, and as Roger says, it's changing again. So we'll need training in this new Collaborate when, we've just, you know, yeah. when we got used to the Illuminate. And although um, Illuminate did let us down on occasion, C2K were usually there mm -hmm. to try and help solve the problems. Um, but yes, training and, and collaboration with your time with the, the, your partner school is very important. Uh, in my experience, C2K are, are extremely good as regards you know, technical issues, as regards the, the software and the hardware. Um, but I, I, I do strongly take, support the point of Roger that if you had a, th a third party, which we did at Three Resolve Boundaries, where you could lift the phone as regards uh, training uh, up, upscaling of staff and, and actually motivating and inspiring, inspiring you to think of cr more creative ways to use the technology. <coughs> the technology is there. Um, the reliability of it, can, like with any technology, can, can be up or down. Um, but, I mean, it's um, I suppose it's there to be used if the teacher necessarily wants to use it. Well, one point I might just make, uh, Danny, is that the two staff that were employed on Dissolving Boundaries had a really important role in monitoring mm -hmm. the flow of information between the, two, the schools. So because it was all happening in C2K, we could see all of the messages that were being exchanged. And it wasn't as though we wanted to be like Big Brother, mm -hmm. but what it meant was that if we noticed that one school was not contributing, somebody picked up the phone and said, is there a difficulty? Can we come in and help? You know, sometimes a teacher had gone off sick or their system had crashed, but we felt an obligation to make sure that their other, the other school was aware of the difficulty, smoothed things over. So I wouldn't underestimate the importance of that. You know, bringing to schools together is just, it's not easy. I mean, the, these guys are already doing a full-time job. 
and the challenge of working with another school shouldn't be underestimated. Mm -hmm. So I think somebody being there to assist is uh, probably necessary. Sometimes think about you know, the French and the Germans after 1945, um, who are still putting money into Franco-German youth exchanges, mm -hmm. you know, it, because they could see there was a long-term issue that needed to be addressed, namely the relations between the two countries. We saw a bit of that with the British Council. I, yeah. I know, great, but look, thank you. I've learned a great deal today. So. Thank you. And our, our next presentation is from the Centre for Shared Education at Queen's. And I was just wondering what links there might be between the work that you're doing and the work that they're, that they're currently doing, and whether you've had any discussions? Um, not, not directly. Um, you, you'll understand that uh, in the world that we live in, there's uh, naturally enough areas where we can collaborate, and there are others where I suppose we're competitors. Um, so we haven't I'd, quite dissolved the boundaries between the two universities. Yeah. Um, well, uh, the spirit is willing, I can say, on our part. Um, um, I, I think there is um, benefit, if I can put it that way, to be gained from uh, a greater understanding on the part of both universities in terms of what each of us are doing. I think it's probably fair to say that um, the work that Queen's is doing is very good, but as far as I know, they haven't really included ICT as a significant element of that. Um, and that's just an, an accident of a particular trajectory. We got involved in technology very early on, and it was a sort of a natural development for us to, to look to technology as part of the way that we address these things. Perhaps this committee might be the facilitator of that. Um, With pleasure. But um, I, 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 do, I do welcome um, presentation and, and the work which you have given to us and um, I, look, I look forward to actually being included in some of our recommendations. But if there are, if there's any further information which you'd like to um, give to the committee after, after today, um, we certainly would be very willing to receive that. So right. thank you very much for your thank time. Thank you. Thank you very much.